So good morning and today I am really excited to be speaking with Adam Dacey from Mindspace. Um, I'm really excited because um, I will be forever grateful to Adam for teaching me all about mindfulness. Everything I know about mindfulness started with his teaching and, um, you know, just learning with him. So, um, Adam, a very warm welcome and delighted to have you here today. Thank you, Fabian. Merci. Pleasure to be here. Yes, wonderful. So, um, Every time people ask me about mindfulness, I tell them about you and about mind space. So would you like to do that uh, yourself today? So do you want to introduce yourself and tell people, you know, about your business, about, you know, about you, so they know a little bit about you before we, we have a conversation? So I, I, I just, I came across a meditation, um, I was actually thinking about it the other day because I usually say that uh, I came across it in Nepal. So I went to Nepal in 1994 on what is known as a, a gap year or in some parts a gap year. Uh, that, so that was my uh, exposure to, to, to meditation. But prior to that, and it dawned on me the other day uh, that uh, I used to watch a, a, a series called Twin Peaks, uh, which was on TV in the, in the early 90s, you know, Twin Peaks. And Agent Dale Cooper was a practitioner of meditation. Mm. And I was quite a fan of him. You know, he was an FBI agent who was brought into town to investigate uh, a happening that had taken place. And uh, he would sit and meditate sometimes on his bed. And I found that quite intriguing as to what he was doing. He was just sitting there and appearing like he wasn't doing anything, but he was. So I think that was my actual first exposure to seeing someone meditate, watching Twin Peaks. And then when I went to, uh, I went to Nepal, so I finished my A-levels and I studied philosophy and psychology and history. So, and um, mainly uh, when you study philosophy at A-level, you're, you're studying Western Greek philosophy. And the Greeks, like Aristotle and Plato, they they touch upon some of the themes of Buddhism that Buddha introduced, like, for example, happiness. Aristotle wrote a text called Ethics. And he, you know, he said, happiness is the flourishing of the human soul. And I found that just that line, very inspirational. You know, happiness is the flourishing of the human soul, talking about finding happiness within, leading, yeah. uh, having a lifestyle that introduces, that brings about happiness. Mm -hmm. And then when I came to, when I went to Nepal, I, I didn't actually specifically go to Nepal to learn about Buddhism and meditation, but I was intrigued by uh, this country that, seemed to be a little bit remote and perhaps operating at a different speed to some of the other like india china there are options to go there but they you know rapidly developing whereas nepal seemed to be a little bit slower and of course there's the himalayas so there's the pull to yeah. that and just to go somewhere as far away as possible <laughs> from from the life that i was leading here so when I went to Nepal, I, I came a, like a, a couple of days in, we had an orientation exercise and we learned about Nepalese culture, you know, the, the, the namaste, which is, you know, when you place your hands together at your heart, 
which is the the Nepalese greeting when they say namaste and it and it it translates really as I greet you from my heart to you uh, so they tend not to shake hands which is quite common in across I mean in India they do but across Asia that when they greet each other they tend not to to, to is it, yeah yeah. Which is quite interesting when you when you start to look at. I mean, you know, obviously now we're going through COVID nineteen and people are not touching. Them. And they're, they're not, but when you look at the when you look at the cases, I mean, I don't want to go too much into that, but when you look at the cases in some parts of Southeast Asia, for example, in Thailand, where they they don't really physically interact when they mm. meet each other, like they don't kiss each other on the cheek. They don't hold hands. They don't embrace. They what? They they call it a why. And the same in Nepal, that the spread has been. It seems like it has been restricted compared to. Anyway, they so, and then a couple of days in, I was sitting in, in Kathmandu. Uh, in a place called Bodhinath, which is, an area in Kathmandu where. Uh, the Tibetans, this is the Tibetan refugees, uh, established themselves and they built the many, many monasteries. And there's a famous stupa uh, where there's some holy relics inside the stupa. In a stupa is a representation of Buddha's mind. And I was sitting there in a cafe uh, with a couple of friends who I'd met there. And we were just sitting on the, they have these rooftop cafes in Kathmandu, you know, so you sit on the rooftop having your chai. And then we were just sitting, looking at this stupa and no one was saying anything, you know, just sitting in a sense, like just mesmerized by this calm and all these monks walking around the stupa you know, dressed in maroon robes, shaved heads, lay people walking around, some people meditating, some people doing prostrations. And there was just something incredible happening. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. And then seeing some of the uh, Tibetan people who, and uh, just with some unique quality that they had, that came across straight away, which is a happiness, you know, and that goes back to the happiness that was referred to in that when I was studying the philosophy, you know, happiness is comes from the flourishing of the soul. So in, uh, you know, the sort of Western culture, we talk about the soul, but in Buddhism, they talk about the mind. They would say happiness coming from the mind. And then in a sense, witnessing that, you know, not just intellectually or reading a book, but witnessing that happiness. And I'm thinking, I want a bit of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this thing, how can I get that? So I immediately went and bought a maroon hat, you know, because all the monks wearing these maroon hats. I thought, well, maybe that would get me started if I wear, you know, dress. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. As you, as you, you know, like when people see Kate Middleton buying a new, uh, you know, sporting a new, summer dress the next yeah. thing you know it's sold out yes yeah. It's, yeah, it's a yeah. human thing isn't it we naturally imitate those mm. who we're impressed yes. by yes it's mirror neurons isn't it in neuroplasticity is the fact that that's how we learn and that's how yeah. we, we grow yeah definitely so, so i bought this hat and then um as i would well as i was walking down from the cafe in Kathmandu, these cafe, you know, very, very steep staircases. Um, and I saw a poster and it said 10 day meditation retreat. Introduction to a Buddhist meditation 10 day retreat. And this was in October. It's like the October retreat. And I turned around to a few friends and I said, right, that's where we're going in October because <laughs> this was in late August, early September. And so what wow. happens is we, we were teaching English and we had all the, uh, uh, you know, in the Hindu, N N Nepal is a Hindu, 85% Hindu now. 
and generally in the Hindu calendar, there's a lot of holidays. So although we were teaching in schools, we had a lot of holidays, uh, Diwali, Desayan, and so forth. And the next, the upcoming holiday was in October. So we, already people were talking about what you're going to do. They were going, let's go white water rafting. Let's go to Chitwan National Park. Let's go to uh, Pokhara and go checking in the Annapurnas. Or let's go to Everest Base Camp. I said, no, 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 no. You don't want to be doing that. Let's go to this 10-day meditation retreat. Yeah. So I managed to drag about four or five of them along with me. And then went to this retreat in uh, Copan, uh, Copan Monastery, which is just... It's, you've got Kathmandu Valley and it's just outside Kathmandu Valley and back then uh, this was like 94 when you go when you walk from uh, Bodhinath or Kathmandu city out to Copan it's like you were walking through hill uh, fields farmlands and as you gradually walked out the pollution decreased and it started to become more and more calm and pleasant and then you walked your way up to Copan and when you arrived at Copan, you know, you could see all the valley, Kathmandu Valley. Mm -hmm. And then beyond the valley, you could see the Himalaya. Wow. You know, so the, the snow peaked mountain. So just in a sense, being there without hearing any information, you, you get a sense of, wow. Yeah, a sense of awe, like nature itself tells yeah. you. Mm. you get a sense of vastness and mm. immediately I mean, like like i went back to nepal uh in november this last year you know there's a place called nagakot which is a, a couple of hours drive outside Kathmandu valley and it's you can get some of the best views of the himalayas in stone's throw from uh, the city and uh, you know every morning we'd wake up and watch the sunrise and there's just this sense of when you, there's something beautiful about seeing a human and looking at a vast landscape, mm. you know, this sense of awe and like peace seems to descend on you, you know? And the, so I kind of got, had that, the whole environment helped to inspire. Mm. I think if I'd have, you know, gone down to my local community, dusty community hall on a wet, you know, Monday evening. <laughs> you might not have been as inspired. <laughs> yes. It doesn't sound as, as, um, as beautiful, as, as um, fascinating. No, no yeah. I, think, I think for me personally, at that age, you know, 18 or whatever, I needed to be like bowled over. And I needed an extremely strong dose to get me started. And it was, that was it, you know, and then did the retreat. And, you know, I, I often talk about the first meditation. So I remember the first meditation, you know, we sat down. So the retreat was led by um, some Tibetan lamas and uh, translated and a few Western uh, ordained uh, Westerners who had, been there you know maybe practicing since the late 70s and uh, i remember the very first meditation and she just said you know which is what you will be saying to people and what is you know bring your attention to the breathing you know and the so focus on the breath and then after a few moments i was like right that's it that's what I need to be hearing. It was just so clear. It was just like, that's it. Yeah. And then I kind of, at that point, I mean, it wasn't, you know, I didn't have a clear kind of path over the next X amount of years, but I just sort of knew that this was what I needed to hear. This was probably the most important, some of the most important information I'd ever received. Mm -hmm. And in the back of my mind is this question like, why hadn't I discovered this before? before. Something as simple as, you know, because as soon as you focus, as soon as you focus on the breath, it's just, you, you just go into this different space. Your, your, your body relaxes, your mind relaxes, that nervous chatter. 
Yes, yes. And, and, you know, this is, if you think in terms of science, the, the, the breath does both. So it's sort of, it, it links to both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. So the, the fight and flight and, the, and yeah. the soothing system. And actually, if we were taught that, that yeah. uh, expire, you know, there's sort of, a, you, know, in, you know, breathe in, breathe out. You know, the reason when we stress, I don't know if, it, it, you know, I, I notice myself, I know when I yeah. need to take, to sort of pull, take a, a you know, press the pause button and, and breathe yeah. for a bit because I find myself walking around going, like really exhaling, <laughs> like needing, like so I just go, okay, my body's telling me it's time to press the pause button and to just sit here and and just actually stop my mind from racing all over the place and you know being so you know not not present in my body and being physically yeah. here. So mm. yeah it's uh I, I was leading a meditation this morning, you know, doing lockdown, I've been offering these meditate with Adam sessions. So they're daily meditation sessions We're on session 45. So we started on the day of lockdown, you know, and I was saying, I don't know if I was saying to them today, was it I was saying about how it's simple, but it's not easy. No. You no. Know, the, the breath it's, uh, yeah, it's a simple explanation. I remember one of my friends from the Buddhist center, he, 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 he had a completely different experience. He was, he went along to a, a town hall in uh, Manchester, you know, and uh, there was a teacher there, you know, sitting there in his corduroy trousers and checkered shirt offering digestive biscuits and Thai food tea. <laughs> and he, he, he went along. And similar thing, you know, as you often do when you go to your first meditation class, he sat down and the teacher said, right, you know, in his calm tone, focus on the breath. You know, in the same way I was told to. And, and then for him, it was like, why can't I focus on my breath? He, he was like, this is, and he, he almost felt offended, you know, that <laughs> something yeah. so simple and yeah. he, he accomplished so many things, you know, and thought he was so kind of special, such mm. a special person. And then he couldn't sit there for two or three seconds. <laughs> Without being distracted. Am and, I? <laughs> and, and, yeah. And for him, he went back the next week because he was kind of annoyed with himself that he couldn't focus for more than a few seconds. So we're all kind of pulled in in, in slightly different ways. We all, we all have connections with um, the practices. You know, for me, I needed to get out there. And, and another thing uh, that meant that was the reason why I first got into it is it was something that I felt I had discovered for myself. Yes. And none of my, uh, my family didn't know anything about it. Uh, no one that I knew before knew. And it was like my thing. Mm. And this is what I often say in, in, when I'm, you know, referring to, you know, do some work with schools and introducing meditation to the next generation how to pass it on, how to inspire them. And I often say to teachers, I recount this, this story and I say, you have to be careful when you're introducing something as special uh, as meditation, uh, which is a life skill, which can, can potentially transform an individual's life and really, and, and, and rescue them, you know, from, potential mental health issues you have to be very careful how you present it to them as a potentially as a parent or as a as a guardian or as a teacher you've got to be so uh, sensitive and aware because the last thing you want to be doing is putting somebody off putting yeah. a child off uh, 
the practice, you know. Um, or, or get them to become so blase about it. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's just oh mindfulness again. Oh yeah, you know, <laughs> in that in that sort of sense. Yeah, it, 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 I mean, this is why you know I was getting a lot of people sending me this article about. It was a few years ago now. Many people were sending me very enthusiastically and excited about um, some schools in, in the States had uh, introduced meditation uh, in, instead of detention. Uh, and I, I mean, I thought it was, a, you know, an interesting approach. But if I was running a school, I don't think I would personally introduce meditation in that manner to students just introducing meditation you know one may be in extremely enthusiastic about it but just introducing it because you think it's a good idea for somebody is not necessarily the most skillful way of doing it the best way to help others learn the benefits of meditation is to practice it yourself and that is the most difficult and challenging yeah you know to, to actually practice it <laughs> yeah. not to yeah. talk about it but to actually practice it sit down and do it yes yeah and and i think for me that was probably the hardest so when you taught me and you taught me how to deliver the um i remember two things to the, the, the most the things that sort of struck a, a chord for me when when you taught me how to teach mindfulness where the fact that you always refer to the breath as the anchor of the distracted ship of the mind yeah um and that for me really resonates because I almost have, I'm quite a visual person. So I imagine, you know, like my mind being this, this massive boat and it just needs my breath to yes. anchor in the present moment. Yeah. So that, and then the other one was you, you know, the fact that I, it, my practice was the bedrock, that it had to be, the, the solid foundation of anything that I was teaching. Yeah. Um, and, and like you were saying with your friends, I think it's, for me, it was like, oh my God, so many thoughts. It's like, how is that possible? <laughs> just sort of, you know, cause, because until we practice, you know, mindfulness and we sort of really sit with ourselves and get to know ourselves. Cause for me, it was about getting to know you know who I am and how my mind works and yeah. the the way it wanders off and and you know I have to bring it back to the breath. Mm. Um, you know, it, it has been about discovering, you know, discovering who I am, but also like how powerful my breath is if I'm, you know, if I'm feeling nervous or if I feel overwhelmed, just like that, you know, I call it press the pause button where yeah. I'll just stop and it's very you know. practical. It can be mm. very practical in our daily life, yeah. For sure. So when I was um introduced to this meditation, the the, the breathing meditation, the the next real part of the introduction and which was also made a huge impact on my mind is you know because within the, the the training the meditation training buddhist meditation they there's different intentions I mean, even if you're not practicing buddhist meditation from the point of view if you're just practicing a, a kind of secular form of meditation you can have different intentions for practicing like i'm practicing for myself and generally when most people turn up to a class they're not there thinking, how can I save the world? You know, how can I um, bring healing and great peace to the masters? They're thinking, I've got a headache. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm stressed up to my eyeballs, help. You know, which is the first step, you know, working on one's own mind. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm doing this for me. You know, for people yeah. say, you know, me time. I'm getting away and, and, and giving my, and that, that's like the initial intention. But, but then 
on this course, they introduce quite rapidly. I think even on the first session, it's like, imagine yourself when you're meditating, surrounded by closest to you, your, what they call your karmic circle. So the, those who you're intimately connected with, you may not have chosen to be, you know, we didn't choose our parents, did we? We didn't choose our brothers and sisters, but there's these people that we are, have this connection with, imagine them surrounding you. And then surrounding them, your friends, your colleagues, you know, surrounding them, the people you've met. And then if you want to, surrounding them, everyone in your society, everyone in your neighborhood, your country. And then if you want to, they talk about all living beings, visualizing them in all living beings in the aspect of humans, which is seen as an auspicious visualization. So animals in the future potentially will take rebirth as humans, which is seen as a slightly better rebirth because then mentally you can progress and train your mind. So you, you visualize yourself and, and that also had an impact because as soon as you, you, you visualize that you have this, again, this sense of expansion, you know, like you're talking about nature, you know, when you look at a blue sky, you go in the mountains or, you have a sense of release or even when you go in a plane and you look down and you, you just have a sense of space. Mm. When you uh, imagine yourself surrounded by uh, many people, you have a sense of like a higher kind of consciousness in a sense. Yeah. And uh, that adds meaning to one's meditation, greater meaning. It's like I'm meditating on behalf of everybody. And it gives one greater energy and focus to want to meditate. Mm -hmm. It's not just some, it's not just like I'm putting a plaster on my stress. This is going to have great meaning and this is going to be a benefit to many, many people. Mm -hmm. You know, this med I'm meditating on behalf of others. And you can see practically how this works. You know, if you meditate on behalf of others and you include them, as soon as you go out of your meditation and you interact with others, they benefit mm. whether you like it or not, or whether they like it or not. <laughs> Everyone benefits and they benefit more directly if you visualize them. Because if you're more peaceful, if you're calmer, if you're more mindful, if you're more considerate, if you're more loving, if you're more patient, of course. Yes. Everybody benefits. Mm. So those, those two things, it's like the breath and that sense of mental expansion because when you you know when you meditate with that intention it's like you're closing your eyes you're gathering inwards but you're feeling and imagining these people are there you see what i mean so it's a little bit like your intention is outward mm. but you're looking inward is this seems almost contradictory yeah it's for me for me what works is imagining so attention is on the breath yeah but intention is benefit not just myself yes. but others and so it's like because it's the definition of mindfulness i mean you know obviously it's focused focused attention on you know yeah. on the breath or um but also with an intention, with a purpose. Why am I doing this? And I'm doing this to benefit, of course, myself, like you said, but also benefit all of those close to me. And then, you know, my friends, my family, my colleagues, and then yep. you know, the rest of the world. So, yeah, I like that. That sort of attention inwards. So yes. my breath or whatever is the focus of my meditation, but intention outward. Yes, yeah, well said, yeah intention and attention the the one thing you have to be one has to be mindful of is um which can happen you know if you do a lot of these meditations and you, you sometimes come across this in you know potentially in communities where there's a lot of this you know we talk about all living beings i'm meditating on behalf of all living beings <laughs> it's like a very lofty intention yeah. isn't it yes and then but i'm not meditating on behalf of my you know roommate or my mm. neighbor 
or this yeah. person who's annoying the hell out of me. Never mind them. Yeah. But all living beings out there. So it's trying to bring it down to earth and think these people that I'm, and this is, these are representatives. So whoever it is, these people that I'm interacting with, they are my, the representatives of all living beings. So mm. we work with these people. And the way that we treat these is then actually the indication of, of how we actually feel about all living beings. If mm. we are wanting all living beings to be happy, but yet we don't want <laughs> the people closest to us. Yeah. Yeah. Or we find yeah. ourselves actually becoming happy when people are unhappy. You know, perhaps those who we are competing against or who we find slightly annoying, then we need to observe that, you know, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. the non judgment. We need to be mindful of yeah. uh, projections and then come back home and then go again. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they're the teachers, you know, they're the our real teachers are those closest to us. Yeah. And the way that we relate to them. The reason why I'm talking about teachers, because on this retreat, uh, this first retreat, you know, I read a book. One of the, the first books I read is called The Tibetan Book of the Living and Dying. Uh, yes. it, it, it seems to be one of those books that often people read as their first. Someone gave it to me, actually. It was a, a German guy in a dormitory on a road called Freak Street. Wow. <laughs> Which I was saying, yeah, there is actually a road in Kathmandu called Freak Street. Um, it, 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 it gained that name after, you know, like in the 60s, it was uh, Kathmandu was seen as like the end of the, uh, the last stop on the hippie trail. You know, oh, the wow. overlanders. Okay. <laughs> it traveled from... Uh, wherever you know london mm. or whatever to all the way to Kathmandu, and they they congregated on this area of Kathmandu, and they became known as freak street <laughs> freak they decided street. to spend a few nights there <laughs> <laughs> back then actually there, were, there was a few guys who who would were sort of the um, had never gone home you know oh, wow. yeah incredible to see they never actually and they'd sort of been the the authorities had sort of just accepted these guys they, they weren't causing any harm oh wow okay they just uh, suddenly like you sense the call for for <laughs> mindfulness and for you know well, i mean I'd, yeah i'd gone a slightly <laughs> i'd gone a slightly easier way via thai airway yeah. um, like 12 hours as opposed to months but um but in this dormitory, uh, this guy, German guy had, had, had recommended this a Tibetan book of the living and dying. And I read it in this uh, incredible cafe called the Snowman Cafe, which made these delicious homemade cakes. And uh, it actually burnt down a few months later, which was a real shame. Yeah. I went back there after one of the trips and it, it was just uh, ash. But um, in that book, it keeps going on about a teacher, find a teacher, find a teacher, guru, find a guru. You know, guru, it has all sorts of connotations, but really guru is a Sanskrit word, which means, guess what? Teacher. Professor. Professor, yeah. Teacher. It just means teacher, yeah. It just mm -hmm. means teacher. Yeah. Guru. Yes. Uh, or lama in Tibetan. And... Um, I was thinking about, I need to find a teacher, I need to find a teacher. Where, where, where can you get these teachers from? You know, back then you, you couldn't sort of Google meditation teacher. No. So when you did your first meditation and you, when you were over there, did you stay or did you go back to the UK? No, no, I was in Nepal. So I... Yeah, but when you, you did your first of 10 day retreat in, in Nepal, yeah. did you actually come back or decide to go back to the UK or did you stay in Nepal? I was in Nepal, yeah. I was there for six months. Mm -hmm. But that 10 day retreat, uh, it finished. And then there was an option to, to do an extra three days silent retreat. 
and uh, I didn't really have that much money. Well, I had virtually no money, uh, just enough to keep me going. And uh, so I resigned to the fact that I, was, I wasn't able to do this retreat because you had to pay a little bit, but not the money that I had. And I went down to the money exchange and uh, I exchanged 100 pounds sterling. No, it wasn't. It was a hundred pound, a hundred dollar traveler's checks. Because back then, you know, it was, you were advised to travel with traveler's checks in dollars. And I put it through the booth with my uh, British passport. And I received back inside the British passport a hundred pound sterling in Nepalese rupees. <laughs> so I, I, I kind of turned away. I, I didn't really, I just saw these rupees, turned away, walked off down the, the dirt track and then opened the passport and thought, hey, up. Oh. Perfect. I can do that course now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, and it was like the, the exact amount that was needed. So wow and so i stayed on a bit longer and did the, the silence bit and a bit more meditation learned how to do walking meditation and, and we did the uh, the one meal a day thing and we learned how to do prostrations and say some mantras and that that kind of uh secured the all the information from the 10-day retreat yeah, and then I spent another six months in Nepal, or five months, uh, just kind of, I was teaching English, reading, and learning the, the practices, you know. Yeah, so that's the bit of the, how I initially, back in the 90s. Got into, into, fell um, in love with, with mindfulness and discovered it, found it, and... So, yeah, I mean, I suppose my thing was more Buddhism. It was the Buddhist, the whole Buddhist, just the looking at Buddhist statues, mm. the Buddhist way, especially the way of loving kindness and compassion, these, these concepts. That was my real uh, connection. I suppose. Yeah. And, you know, following on from that, I decided that I was going to go deeper into it. So I spent the next 10 years, mainly based in the UK, you know, going deep into studying Buddhist meditation, doing retreat. So my entire twenties were taken up with that. Wow. So in a sense, it's like this lockdown now, uh, it's kind of reminded me of some of those times because uh, quite a period, you know, some periods we were just in retreat and not really going out very much. It was a mile and a half to the bus stop. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and then you had to get a bus, mile and a half walk, and then your bus into... Into town. Uh, if you wanted to be connected. So we were kind of, but in a sense, it was like being in a greenhouse where you could focus and concentrate mm -hmm. your energies on, you know, meditation and get some depth. You know, there's different levels of meditation. And when you go in retreat or you step back, you can uh, go deeper into your mind because there's less distraction. And even from the point of view of daily meditation, that can start to give you a sense of depth that, you know, I, since the, I've been running these daily meditation sessions uh, since the COVID uh, lockdown, some attendees have mentioned that they've, they've felt that they've made more progress from just coming along to a weekly class, you know? Yes. 
because you've always got that you've got that sense of depth that you're you're not losing mm. like you do a weekly class you the first part of the class it's almost like damage limit you know damage limitation you're you're trying to just to clear all the distractions from the week and then finally when you get into that space it's time to finish yeah if, if you if you have a daily practice you're kind of topping up you're not sort of two steps forward three back it's yeah. one step forward and then another yeah and then another like tending to a garden you know if you pull the weeds as they appear in your garden then it's less difficult than if you let it completely overgrow with like loads of, of weeds and that then exactly you've got to spend it. hours and hours doing it that is um, exactly it mm. it's um it's one of those things it's easy to start something it's easy to join something it's easy to buy a book or these yeah. things are the easiest things in the world but to be able to keep doing it and you know in the, in the tantric text they call it, they talk about completion stage so completion stage cities you know the ability to complete things is uh, underestimated and undervalued skill mm. i don't know if you remember there was some there used to be some game show i don't know when it, it was that you said i've started so i'll finish i mean <laughs> you know you started so be, let me finish but when you start something can you finish it you know and you started meditating, but can you keep going? And all these incredible benefits that are going to come, can you practice so you can get those? Because they're not just going to fall down from the sky. No. You know, like in the past in Tibet, they would go on pilgrimages um, to, to go and hear a teaching. And, you know, Tibet, there wasn't like a... <laughs> You know, back in those days, they didn't necessarily have buses, even buses, or there's no train. There are trains now, but in the past, there were no buses. And sometimes they would have to walk. And some of them would go via prostration. Prostrations are the physical action, where, you know, where you press your crown, forehead, um, throat, heart, and put your body on the floor. And they would travel like that. So they prostrate go down, get themselves up, prostrate again. You can see it on YouTube if you just try Tibetan. And they would travel to a teaching like that. Wow. <laughs> so let's say, for example, they, they want to go to receive a teaching about a lojong. So lojong, Tibetan word for training the mind. It's, it's crucial importance how we can learn to train the mind. So great teachers, Geshe Langu Tangpa, some of these great Geshe's, they, they gave these teachings on how we can train the mind. And people would travel for potentially a month like that to get to a teaching. <laughs> so, you know, by the time they got to the teaching and they sat there, listening to the teaching just think how engaged yeah. they would be yeah you know and mm. how it would be like going directly into their heart mm. how much effort they put into receiving and, and, and in a sense how much value they've put into that so you can say to someone, oh, this is really valuable. Like what I'm going to tell you now, it's really valuable. And they say, oh, okay, this is really valuable. But to actually put in that amount of effort to receive something indicates you actually believe it has value. And the, these teachings, they have incredible value. But one of the things is, is that it is great that there's so many teachings that are widely available. You know, you can just at the touch of a button, you've got tens of thousands 
Yes, you've got loads of apps and loads of, yes, it's, it's everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You talk about the Spotify and meditation, and, which is wonderful that people have, you know, put so much time and energy into creating uh, this technology that we can share, you know, we can share all these practices. This is fantastic. But at the same time, as individual practitioners, we need to bear in mind that if we're not careful, we will diminish the value of what we are receiving simply because it's so easy to access when something mm. is easy to access when something is, I mean, as humans, we're naturally lazy and we want the easy option, but that's not necessarily beneficial for us and or even helpful when no. something is easy. You imagine if someone said, right, you've got an app, <laughs> You know, you've got an app that you can get, but you're going to have to prostrate for a month, you know, with a rucksack on your back to access what's in there. You'd have to be really <laughs> motivated to do it, right? I'm not sure many people would bother. <laughs> so... Yeah. Uh, that's so the, what you call intrinsic motivation, right? That's... that's intrinsic motivation to a T it's, it's really like you would have to be highly motivated to, to do it to have highly a reason for yeah. doing it what we need to appreciate some of these practices like um, many practices that have been interpreted for the modern day have been pulled and inspired from some of these ancient practices mm. and some of them are, are even secret yes. you know, or only given to a few students who had already uh, trained their minds in for a long time to build the foundations. So generally within the kind of mindfulness world, you have the, or the whole meditation mindfulness, but you have the kind of the extremes of those who, who say there's too much out there. Uh, it's the, the original message of Lord Buddha has been diluted. The pure and mistaken lineages have been diluted. Uh, you know, there's this, this side, the, this, it's, it's the more sort of Buddhist, pure Buddhist side. And then the other, there's then there's the other extreme that is, you know, trying to make as much of, as possible available and interpreting it and, sharing it and making and money out of it also because it's become a real industry capitalizing it yeah. yeah and um and going down the pure scientific route you know it's the mindfulness from the the, the, the sort of the, lo the laboratory type yes. mindfulness well Mindful john kabat-zinn's work and you know putting people in scanners like uh exactly yeah. professor about zen yeah. yeah and then so but you know he himself came from a he has some you know practicing within the zen traditions and the buddhist yeah. traditions yeah but it, it it's interesting the 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 polarities you know and um from a buddhist perspective you know from what when buddha taught you know buddha Buddhism is often interpreted as the middle way. You know, Uma, the middle way. Finding the middle way. And that there's the famous analogy of when, before Buddha became Buddha, you know, Buddha means awakened when he, he was training like we are. And he was going from extreme to extreme. He was a prince living in a palace, opulent palace, everything he desired, which is similar to us. We may not live in palaces, but we have an abundance, don't we? Mm -hmm. And then he renounced all that, not just mentally, but physically. He had enough, went and left. And then he, he became an ascetic, you know, joined a band of wandering ascetics and deprived himself of delicious biryanis and just, you know, sat there and meditated all day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, learned how to survive on next to nothing. But, as he went to the extreme mm. he became a hardcore enunciate and 
we generally like to hear this. Oh, you don't need to renounce. You don't need to become a renunciate. Buddha didn't. But it, it's not to be misinterpreted. He, he, he went to the extreme. And then he, he was sitting, the story goes, he was sitting by a river. As he tended to do under a tree, which, he, you know, under the shade of a tree. And he was sitting there meditating. And then he heard a, someone having a sitar lesson on the river and the teacher said if you tune the string too tight it will snap and if you tune it too loose it will be dull you need to tune it in the middle get that middle sweet sound mm. you know and those who, who play a stringed instrument they'll appreciate it once you get you find that middle that sweet spot you can play a beautiful sound potentially and that was his moment of maybe i need to chill out a bit <laughs> yeah no, but from one extreme to the next <laughs> you know maybe i need to stop taking this myself so seriously and um maybe have a bowl of yogurt and that's apparently what happened you know some because in the past you know there's a tradition in asia you know offering mendicants uh, monks whatever a food you know so a child came up to him with some a bowl of curd and he, he took it and then he ate it and he was like oh yeah that's good <laughs> and he, he and then from that moment he realized that he'd gone to the the ex he, he, mm. he was following this extreme and he managed to find this middle way. So I'm referring to the, the, you know, the sort of the mindfulness movement where we are today with it. And it's the same with anything with human nature. There's always camps, aren't there? And you can see now with COVID-19, there's the camps, we should stay in lockdown. There's the other extreme, we should go and go back Have to fun and go back to normal and start hugging each other. It's all made up. <laughs> <laughs> yes. you know we had it with brexit we, yes it yes. is human nature and yes. what is in, it's interesting to see that from a society perspective but what's more interesting from a meditative perspective it is seeing it in one's own mind seeing how we veer from the extremes we may not even notice it but even during one day, we ex we go from extreme to extreme. You can see it yeah. in relationships. One minute we love someone or love someone. The next minute we're wanting to kill them. <laughs> you know, yeah. we can't bear the sight of them. Yeah. Now that is extreme. But what we tend to misunderstand is that it's actually coming from our mind. It's not the person. It's not this person who's making us feel like this. It's what's known as the extreme of attachment and then the extreme of anger, you know. Or, you know, they talk about the extreme of existence and the extreme of non-existence, holding on very tightly, getting really, really serious about everything, really, you know, and then... Oh. <laughs> Let it go, <laughs> because you can't hold on tight too you know, much. I've had <laughs> enough, yes. you know, I don't care anymore. I'm giving up. I've tried my hardest with them. All this, this kind of, and this is what we do. You know? mm. Or we set something, you can see it from a business perspective, set something up, get really enthusiastic, you know, and, and get really excited because excitement is a form of grasping, you know, go, 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 go. But you can't sustain that energy. No. And then as, when there's a difficulty or a problem, we get disheartened and then potentially go to the other extreme and give it all up. Yeah. Even from the point of view of a marriage, you know, mm -hmm. you see the extreme in a marriage. We see someone, we can't wait to spend the rest of our life with them, you know, going to deep, deep attachment. But we can't sustain that energy eventually. No, no. no because, because, you know, so that's one thing in, in the English language that has always been an issue for me you know in talking about marriage my other half 
when people say that to me, I just go, no, sorry, Jason is not my other half. I'm actually a full person. I don't, yeah. I don't need him to complete me. <laughs> is, there, is, there a, is there a phrase in French that you use? No, we wouldn't say, well, I guess, yeah, you could say ma moitié, but that, that's, yeah. I guess, I guess you could say, you know, my, my other half, my, my moitié in French. Mm. But, um, but that is very symptomatic of what you're describing. The very, you know, you, I need you because you complete me and you make me whole. And then I hate your guts and we get divorced and we have them. <laughs> yeah. You know, so this, I had this conversation with a friend was just sort of saying, it, it's amazing how you can love someone so, so much, you know, so believe you love them and then hate them as it would be equally sort of the same, mm. the same. And this is what you're describing, right? Yeah, but it's that police song, isn't there? I think it's the police. If you love someone, set them free, free, free set them free but I, I, w I was going into that just as using it as a as an example of the extremes you know bringing it down to the extreme of existence and non-existence the two extremes we can see it in many many parts of our life business relationships emotions even from the point of view of when we wake up grasp onto the day yeah and this whole seize the day, carpe diem, can be completely misunderstood. You know, uh, seize the day. Um, and then the only time we can let go of it is when we're so exhausted we collapse into bed. <laughs> yeah, so our life is like the extreme of existence. I'm alive. You know? And then the extreme of non-existence, we sleep and we've got no idea what's going on and we go into a state of unconsciousness. <laughs> but the middle ways, you know, trying to find this balance. And with respect to the thing we were talking about, you know, the mindfulness movement where we are in 2020. And the reason why I bought it the middle way is it, it's always looking at the middle way, you know appreciating research appreciating those who are only coming into the world of mindfulness and meditation simply because it's been expressed in a more modern uh, scientific manner you know they've been mm -hmm. even recommended it by their doctor you know mm -hmm. or perhaps someone who's just stumbled across it on an app you know they've yeah. had a free voucher for an app and then that they've managed to access it that way. And um, the accessibility is, is quite incredible now of all these teachings. Well, at the same time, appreciating the origins, appreciating the history, appreciating the lineage of instructions and taking that and moving forward, not being stuck in the past. Mm. you know fortunately we don't need to learn tibetan we don't need to learn japanese or chinese you can do and it may actually uh color and it and strengthen your meditation but you don't need to learn these these languages to get started i mean it's trying to it's a really helpful approach the middle way in any whenever you need to make a decision when you're looking at a problem it's like what's the middle way here that doesn't mean to say we sit on the fence and never have a view or opinion. It just means to say that we, we appreciate the extreme. Yeah. I love that because the purpose of creating the podcast was to, to get conversations going with <clears throat> you know, experts, people like yourself to, to almost what I, I view as, you know, challenging our views. So my view of, of my, my perception of you know, my map of the world and other people's map of the world and recognizing that my, my truth, what I call my truth is just that's my truth. And someone else's truth is just that their truth. And yeah. that if there is such a thing as the truth, and I'm not sure there is, you know, and that's what you're referring to is you're the, the yeah, middle way then maybe it's a it's it's the in between of of our perceptions in sort of in, in there in the middle you know 
Yeah. The, um, yeah. The, the middle way is, um, I mean, there's different, they talk about different truths, you know, conventional truths and ultimate truths. And you know, the middle way is ultimately referring to an appreciation of the way that things exist and uh, the reality, who we really are. Yeah. And, 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 and tapping into the, the real nature of ourself and the world around us and appreciating, you know, one of Buddha's most famous quotes and most helpful quotes is that we are abiding in a dream. We take, a, you know, we take ourselves extremely seriously. Um, and as a consequence, <laughs> we suffer mm. immensely. And in some respects, the more seriously we take ourselves, the more we suffer. And Buddha said, you know, if you can, when you're not meditating, try to abide in a dream, try to feel that your world is dreamlike. And this helps you to let go of what's they refer to as the grasping mm. mentally, like a mind that is doing this. And you can feel, you can see it in your hand. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes yeah. oh why is my hand like that you can see like you you, you get so angry with someone you want to punch them in the face <laughs> cool. why yeah. where's that coming from why is the hand going like that because we're <laughs> mentally going like that but maybe we've restrained ourselves so our hand's not doing that but our body's sometimes doing it and the mindful body scan is <laughs> helping us to appreciate that oh wow there's a lot of tension there. Yeah. And the whole non judgmental thing is that's okay. I'm not a bad person. I'm not, uh, you know, it, 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 it comes and goes. I'm going to observe it, notice it, let it go. But the grasping, it's there. And that takes us to the extremes. Yeah. And Buddha said, try to abide in a dream, try to, let go of that grasping because like for example this conversation now it feels real but where's it going to go in in a, when it's finished yes think of 2019 that felt real mm. where is it now just <laughs> a memory a thought you know something that we have in our you know that we believe we have still in our head you know it, it, things yeah exactly things feel so real mm. but are they as real as they appear they mm. can't be because they're changing and the fact that something is changing means that it it can't be solid if something is solid it can't change mm. so we relate to a world that is solid which indicates it's not changing. But if we tap into it, we say, oh, it is changing. Yes. So it makes absolutely no sense to cling to a world that is changing moment by moment. And that's why there's so much confusion in the mind. The confusion comes because we don't accept the change. That's not just the major changes, but the minor changes, the moment by moment changes. And in a way, if you think about that, we are not the same person that we were, the same people that we were before this conversation, because this conversation will have, you know, changed part of, of our truth and part of, you know. Yeah. So, yes, I, I love that. And this is what I loved about your teaching. This is what really drew me to, to your teaching in particular, is because I think, um, you know, you, you really bring that th those aspects of you know the, the the buddhism and 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 a lot of that you know ancient so you know buddhism 2500 years ago is that right yeah and counting yeah. yeah yes so you know really really like this notion of walking walking on the shoulders of giants and yeah. this is why i always acknowledge your teaching because i just feel that what you taught me is this you know a tiny tiny insight into what you learned when you went to nepal and you know from from the, that buddhist tradition in a very respectful way but in a way that fits in with our western world 
but but that feels very respectful and that really really love in your teaching good to hear fabian Merci yeah beaucoup. No, that's true. I really, I, that's what really drew me to your teaching. And I, you know, I really recommend our um, listeners to, to go and have a look at what you do, you know, your website. I'll put the links to your website and, and all of that. Yeah, your... merci, Fabian. Everyone is welcome, you know. Mm. And we are, we are pioneers, you know. It's uh, early days. Mm. And, yeah. These are gold. This is like the golden age for us here in reluctant to call it the West, but you know, here in the, the, the societies that are not Buddhist, we are Christian, uh, mm. you know, our roots, religious roots in many in the UK, Europe, and uh, Christian element, and we. For us, meditation and, uh, the, you know, there's meditation that was introduced in Christianity, but it was phased out uh, and gradually. So the actual practice of meditation for many people now, it's very fresh and it mm. is something extremely new and something to feel excited. You know, there's a sense of excitement yeah. in, in people about meditation, which we have because it's so new you know, in which I had, I know I can say I had, because I felt it was something new for me. So in that respect, where we are now is the golden age. In Asian countries, and some of them are Buddhist, you know, and have been Buddhist for hundreds and hundreds of years, um, they're at a slight disadvantage because it's, it's just normal. Yeah. So there isn't that. Yeah that sense of, wow, I want to learn about this. This is, and, and, you know, I think if your grandparents are doing it, it's not cool, is it? <laughs> no, if you're a teenager, it's not yeah, Exactly. Cool. You know, if I'd have gone along to family <laughs> gatherings in the late eighties, nineties, and you know, my grandparents are like, I, I don't, we're going to do a 15 minute breathing meditation. It'd be like, Oh God, what? Or come on, let's go along to the temple and do some meditation. So, you know, in Asian countries, their grandparents, great grandparents, there's a tradition of, and, and in many Asian countries, you know, the, the sense of, um, you know, even though the Buddha himself taught, the heart of what Buddha taught was meditation, sitting and meditating. You know, in some cultures, Asian cultures, because it's it's so embedded in the culture and there's so much of a organization and structure and property based around the faith. And there's often a, a lack of, uh, or not so much energy and enthusiasm for meditation in the temples. So in the temples, you may find and people attend the temples uh, for uh, making prayer or making offerings, paying their respects, which is wonderful, you know, to have that sense of calm. But the amount of meditation that takes place, and some of these temples, they're actually very busy, you know, especially in the cities. So people will just pop in and, depending on where it is, make a little prayer or and then go out and uh, so for some people there was you know for a child or a teenager who's trying to have it work out what is going on buddhism or it will not necessarily be associated with meditation mm. it'll be associated with going to get some good luck or praying that you get good test results you know or praying whatever it is, you know, which is external, which isn't necessarily negative, but it's, yeah. it takes yeah. away the enthusiasm and the energy and the focus on the meditation. So in the West or the, you know, the, the societies where it's new, we definitely need to seize the moments that we have now. Mm -hmm. See ourselves in a golden age 
and yeah. this, and, and, and if you, you you choose to pass it on it's like pioneering it you know and and not waste a single moment no this time you know i think it's it's sometimes challenging to feel that we're extremely lucky i remember saying to someone the other day you're so lucky <laughs> and they they just looked what on earth are you going on about i'm not lucky yeah. and we are and it's we are. Yeah, the, the abundance, you know, you were talking about the fact that, you know, this is something obviously so the, with the mindfulness, we've talked about the, the breath and the power of the breath, but there are a lot, a lot, a lot of meditations we can, we can obviously focus on, right? So right. gratitude and, and uh, the, the, the loving kindness and, and all of those things, which to me are, are much more, um, I would describe them as being more advanced. So I couldn't really do that whilst my my bedrock wasn't wasn't sort yes, of settled. Yes, so yes. you know that until I could do the breathing meditation and just being yeah. able to sit there and focus on my breath, then it's much more challenging to go into the you know practicing gratitude and all loving kind kindness. Um but those are really vital. So you were saying like, you know, Carpe Diem cease the moment. The first thing I do every single morning when I wake up is eat, when I wake up and I'm lying in bed, I wiggle my hands and wiggle my toes and take a breath and go, thank you for an extra day on this planet Earth. Yeah. And that shifts your approach to... I've woken up and I've got to go and work and I've got to do things, yeah. right? It is just like, I'm alive in a really, wow, thank you for this extra day. And, you know, alive in a sense that I can get out of this bed unaided, which is so much more than some people can do. Yeah, what know? a way to start the day, Fabian, yeah. And so, but that to me is a much more... I would describe it, I mean, I don't know if it's, it's, if it's my mind, again, trying to sort of label things because we mean, you know, meaning making machines that so we want to make sense of things. Yeah. But to me, those practices are more advanced than, than just focusing on the breath. Would you agree with that? It's an interesting point that you raise. And uh, I, I would say that you know, Buddha himself taught 84,000 teachings. He's prolific, you know. And um, and I often say to students and um, that, that there are different practices, but you may find, you know, the, the sort of the, the linear way of looking at it, which you say, you know, you start with the breath. You, you pacify the distractions and then you bring in these other practices later, which is makes com is common sense. But at the same time, because we're so we're all so different and we're all at different points in our life. And uh, it, sometimes for someone gratitude will work more than the breath, you know, they may not the, the breath just may not work. The, yeah. the mind just may be so overactive. Yeah. I was talking to someone last night about it. He was saying it's just it is simple, but I need something to, to 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 connect my busy mind to. Mm -hmm. So gratitude may be, uh, yes. maybe and the way, and, and then and, and they come back into the breath. It's like mm -hmm. so as a teacher or well, as a practitioner and 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 someone helping others teaching. It's useful to 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 learn all these meditations. And then just to have the, like a pharmacist, you know, you, you, you've, you have them all and you, you've got experience of some of them. And then someone comes along and asks, and then he's like, okay, well, <laughs> you know, in your mind, you're going through the, the cabinet. Okay. And then, you, and then like a pharmacist will try this dose, you know, take this once a day, come back next week. And, and it, it's a similar thing. It, it, there's dosages, you know, it's like before we went live, I, I asked you, 
what dose, you know, what strength do you want? <laughs> you, were, you were talking about, we we're talking about mindfulness, you know, what, what strength dosage do you want? And, and it's, there's dosages and yeah. strengths of all these practices. But it's, if you were creating a course, that would make sense. And that's what I do myself, you know. I created this eight-week mindful course. So listening to the sounds around us, step one. Becoming aware of the body physically, step two. Step three, becoming aware of the breath. Step four, becoming aware of the mind. Four steps. So that's the linear approach. That's bringing the, the complete beginner into the present moment. And that, I would suggest that as a, as a kind of formal, practical, step-by-step -step approach. And then the other, five, the other four, moving. Mindful movement. How you can take it out and about with you. Next step, eating. Energy. How you can interact with your food and your drink in a mindful way. So it's tangible. Next step, sleeping. How you can sleep calmly, wake up in the middle of the night and you know how to get back to sleep. How you can live your life to help you sleep better and how your sleep can energize your life. And finally, the mindful heart, which is to some degree what you were talking about, loving kindness, gratitude. So I dropped that in at the end. And then sometimes, you know, people who are initially attending the first beginner courses, they're like, okay, so the, they turn up to the, the eighth week and it's like okay so it's the eighth week and then you sort of drop in <laughs> the, you know you drop in the mindful heart and it's just like oh there's probably a few more things to learn here yes yeah and, and, <laughs> <laughs> and if if that penny drops they, they they've understood it's like i put it in at the end because it's it, it it's like you've learned all these these practices for yourself that is wonderful. Take, you know, as they say, take care of yourself first. You know, the old oxygen mask on the plane. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta, you gotta get your head above water first. Seven weeks of doing that. Eighth week. Now, look at how you can relate to others with mm -hmm. compassion. Even wish for someone else to be happy. Wish for even someone that you don't know to be happy, and then go even further. Even wish for someone you don't like to be happy. Oh, that's the hardest. <laughs> <laughs> and as you rightly said, you know, if we're not focusing on the breath and not pacifying our mind and not happy in ourself, why are we going to want other people to be happy? Yeah. And why yeah. would we ever entertain wanting someone that we don't like to be happy? Yeah, totally. So, um, skillfully practicing for oneself but if you're introducing it to others there definitely needs to be some element of skill because and this is what we're talking about with respect to introducing it to children uh, because you don't want to be putting someone off or you know when people come along to receive help from you you want them you want to you want them to be calm and peaceful you want them i remember one of my friends you know appears saying you know you've done a good job at a class if people walk in uh, you know, with their troubles and worries, a little bit of a frown on their face, and they go out and they've got a smile on their face. Yeah. You know, so we wanted to be, you want to be able to help people to elevate them. And if one presents the practices unskillfully or maybe a little bit too strong, and that may come across because one is enthusiastic or whatever it is, or we, we, we don't have that empathy or, then it, it, it can even do more harm than good mm. yeah. you know that i'm not going there again or i'm not i'm giving up on meditation now if that's what it's all about yeah. go down the pub next week have a few jars of yeah of yes have have um have alcohol instead or you know whatever it is we use to numb the pain the we all have our drug of choice, right? <laughs> well, I'm on the old Earl Grey at the moment. <laughs> Earl Grey, coffee, um, sugar, mine, but definitely mine. Um, oh, are you an Earl Grey fan yourself? Yeah, I like Earl Grey. I, I think for me, what um, 
but also coffee also you know sugar is a big big um soothing uh technique in my life but i you know i think this is one of the things that i'm really grateful to you for is that you know having learnt the practice first for myself before starting to teach it for others is that i've learned to recognize you know to 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 be more self-aware to have more self-awareness um yeah. which which is such a such a gift if anything else you know even if you don't want to teach it just having that self-awareness and noticing what's going on for what do you, you mean as by, what do you mean by self-aware so i think it's noticing what's going on for me in the present moment so if someone is saying something and that's generating or triggering emotions in me um so noticing that in fact my emotions are my mind telling me where where i'm at so i look at my emotions are as as my internal compass in a way like a internal sat nav nice. that tells me where my mind is at um but you have to be present in what's going on in your body you know so is that again is that attention intention yeah. you know sort of like noticing the it's inward looking but not in a navel gazing way not in a you know aren't i great and look at me and am i not wonderful but actually really noticing what's going on yeah for me as i'm interacting with with the world with other people and you know yes interesting and I, yeah and i think that's that's what i feel i have gained the most out of of learning and practicing that's good to hear and one one of the uh, inspirational uh, themes that can arise as we continue practicing and it may be helpful to raise here you know due to the uh, what is happening in our world at the moment and is that is is questioning and being self aware as you mentioned of our relationship with suffering mm. you know, yes and i think we need to have another podcast because <laughs> that's a whole new conversation suffering death fear you know all of those emotions because i think they've been completely amplified with covid-19 and yes with, uh, but just briefly like shanti deva who was a great uh, Indian uh, master, Buddhist master, who uh, his famous text, Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life, he said, you know, suffering, uh, moreover, suffering has good qualities. And um, Buddha, the, the very first words that Buddha taught, so what's important to appreciate, you know, mindfulness, whether you like it or not, originated within the Buddhist tradition, you know, it, this is where it came from. And it's one part of what Buddha taught. Buddha taught many, many different things, but it, the very first thing he said was, this was what he said when he came, the, the words that came out of his mouth, uh, when he first taught, you know, five students, the deer park in Sarnath, he said, you should know suffering. Just that. <laughs> is, yeah you should know suffering and then a bit later on shanti davis said suffering has good qualities so the reason why i'm mentioning it now is that one is we don't want to know suffering and two with respect to what shanti davis said we don't think it's got a good qualities but mm. the first thing is that we if we are honest with ourselves, which is not easy not just with ourselves, but with what is actually going on with us, like our body, you know, we're suffering. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, we've yeah. been sitting down now talking, but you know, and, and in a minute or whenever the session ends, we'll stand up. And then when yeah. we stand up, it'll be like, Oh, I enjoyed that, but it's good. It's good. To, oh. Yeah. You know, and, and we'll that, need to go to the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> and to drink that's what buddha taught that's changed that's not 
that's a relief, but that is changing suffering. Mm. Yeah, that's changing suffering. Now, I mean, this is it's 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 another thing to discuss, but with respect to our relationship with suffering, is that we were born and we didn't come out of the womb with a big grin on our face, high-fiving everyone, saying, wow, I'm so excited. What's going on, everyone? You know, we were screaming our head off. And we've been trying to work things out ever since then and putting on a brave face to tell everyone that everything is okay. But if we are truthful with ourselves, and this has got nothing to do with COVID-19, and it, our life is uncertain, and it was uncertain before COVID, and it will be after of course, now it's bringing everything more to the to, to the fore. It, you know, the uncertainty and can you know and 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 uh, aid uh, sickness that comes about as a human being, and death, because we're being told every day how many people have died, which you know it's awful that people are are dying and people are getting sick. It's terrible. And but what's important to appreciate is that. This is what happens. And this is what happened before COVID-19. You know, I'm not in any way diminishing what is happening, the, the severity of what's happening, but it, this, is, this is what happens as human beings. And it's just being highlighted now because yeah. we're hearing about it. Yeah. And, but when the lockdown is over, we will still be suffering. Yeah. Uh, now, on a knee-jerk response to what I'm saying or an immediate response is like, well, that's a bit miserable. This is, and this is the, this is the ego a getting out of facing up to what's actually happening. That's miserable. That's morbid. You know, but it's neither, neither of those two. If no. that suffering, the, talking about suffering, doesn't have to be miserable and it doesn't have to be morbid your or one is making it miserable or morbid by the way that you think about it so suffering whether it's physical or it's being imposed upon whatever it is it doesn't have to necessarily make us unhappy now this is probably one of the most important points we could ever get so i'm just saying it the words of it but to get it and if we can get that, you know, we have a, have a very firm foundation for actually genuinely being happy, not just I'm fine, thanks, everything's, but genuinely in our heart of hearts, we feel happy because we understand that we suffer, yeah. we're being honest. And when we do suffer, which we will, things, you know, it's positive thinking is great, but it needs to be grounded in reality the reality, the conventional reality that as human beings, we suffer physically. People are going to let us down. You know, it, it's endless what's going to happen. <laughs> but that doesn't have to make us unhappy. If we can stabilize our mind, you know, then it can actually strengthen our mind. It can strengthen our ability to be happy and it can help us to develop qualities you know shanti deva goes on to say you know because suffering has good qualities when we experience problems and difficulties our pride is reduced that's one of the good things that can come our sense of self-importance you know which we have as humans it's reduced and when our pride is reduced we become more peaceful you know, you can see that immediately, like we get offended by what people think, say, think and say to us. If we have less pride. More peace of mind. Yeah. Compassion arises for other people. So it's like if you've ever had a sickness, sometimes you can get a sickness. You never really were aware of people with that sickness before you had it. You get the sickness. It's like you know, you go on some forum or something, you think, oh yeah, there's hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people with it. And then suddenly your heart goes out to them and you feel a sense of connection. Whereas before that, completely oblivious. 
then most importantly, a sense of one of the main reasons why we find it difficult to sit down and be mindful, to meditate, to get into a daily practice, because our mind is so distracted. And people will be seeing this now in COVID-19, like those who, who, uh, who say, like, I'm too busy to practice meditation uh, before COVID-19, and then their lives become quieter, and they're still too busy to practice meditation. <laughs> you yeah. see? Yeah. That that's because your mind is distracted. It's nothing to do with yeah. what's going on in the world around you. You know, people say when they retire, they're busier than they've ever been. So it's, it's a mental thing. But it's, you know, it's coming back to if we appreciate that our life is challenging and we're going to experience suffering, we will put the energy and time into our spiritual life and prioritize that above our worldly life. We'll let go of worldly concerns. So suffering which we're experiencing can really be, you know, going along with your inner compost, you know, the manure of the growth of spiritual realizations, mental realizations. In fact, it's, but it's being able to get our head around all of that it's a deep theme you know it's suffering but not associating suffering with suffering as in with being unhappy yeah and the, this this you know links to the beginning of your conversation around the greek philosophers and the stoics because the stoics talk about the you know that you eudaimonia is that how you pronounce it like uh the the that actually the the flourishing is understanding that as part of being human there is suffering and it's it's about understanding that you can't control that suffering you can't make it go away it will happen it's the ebb and flow of life right so yes. just up and down and that actually the growth and the the expansion happens when we are at the, you know, when we are, we are uh, it's from being under the wave before we surf and under the water that we can really fully enjoy surfing the wave. There we go. Yeah. It's letting go of from um, worldly concerns. Mm. It's like you can say, I don't care what people think about me. You know, I don't care what, what they say, what they do, but we do. Mm. Yeah, you know, and um, <laughs> it's, we we can put our head in the sand and uh, just say I don't care, or we can work out how to not care and not be bothered. You know, I, mean, I don't know what that comedy was. It was it Dawn French. I'm I'm not bothered. Not bothered. <laughs> not bothered. Not bothered. <laughs> <laughs> French and Saunders was it? I can't remember. Yes. Yes. If we are bothered and the way to become unbothered like to not care but to really care you know to care about the important things which is helping other people and to not care about our reputation our worldly concerns is to meditate on death you know is to think to ourselves you know oh god has gone a bit morbid again he hasn't <laughs> <laughs> in fact it's the most uh, elating inspirational subject there is mm. and uh, is to think I may die I may die today does it, do, does it matter that someone has uh, ignored me or criticised me or forgot my birthday you know do these things really matter we say oh no no they don't of course they don't but they do but if we think, if we genuine, and this is a this is a tough nut to crack. I may die today. Yeah. That's the reality. Mm. Things are. We prioritize everything that is important. That's the way to let go. Yeah. That's the way to. That's the. Um, you know, when I was at the in the temple back in Kathmandu, 
on that on that retreat that I managed to wangle my way on with my what was it sterling traveler's check mistaken sterling traveler's check i remember we were meditating there's this meditation that you do on death so looking back on it they did introduce it quite early so you, in the tibetan tradition you do this meditation on death where you um you you imagine that you're dying you know and and, and there are various stages and uh, appearances to mind of the dissolution of the gross mind and i remember doing it and i was sitting there you know and it they just had the candles on and it was a little bit edgy you know to be meditating because the first time i'm meditating on death and and doing the actual meditation where you're dying you know you imagine that you die. and then i i heard this kind of rustling and i looked my eyes open there was this black dog <laughs> it's, it's like the <laughs> the temple dog was just sitting in front of me <laughs> and uh you know because there's a point in the meditation where it, it everything goes dark you know and then gradually it goes clear you're going to clear light because it said that you know, after the dissolution, eventually you're going to a clear light. But it was very uh, unnerving, this black mm. dog appearing. But, you know, the black dog of death, I know it's used to refer to depression, but it's, um, it's following us around mm. wherever we go. I mean, I can't see it at the moment, but one day it's going to be gonna sitting be. right in front of me or by my bed or wherever. And that's going to be it. We need to find a way to bring the information into our heart that we're going to die. Mm. You know, it's, uh, so we can we can appreciate a lot more you know that with that the the heart opens up because then you know you will want obviously under covid 19 if you're not living with people you can't do that but if you know that you're gonna die then you would want to say goodbye to people and give them a you know one last time um but again you know not grasping just acknowledging that and yes. I think for me, that just brings that notion of, you know, when I've practiced that, that meditation, what it's made me think is, if this is going to be my last interaction with you, what do I want no. this last interaction to be about? And for you to, to feel about me or to remember me by, um, and therefore that makes your heart just naturally open up because you want it to be a positive, you know, a, a loving interaction and, a, you know, with a lot of kindness and understanding. Definitely. I think what you say is true. And they, it's said, isn't there? And I've, I've seen it myself that when, if you're with someone who's dying, uh, they, they often tell people that they love them. Mm. Uh, one of my students unfortunately uh you know passed away died and um at quite a young age and is is in the three or four days leading up to it he knew he was going to die you know he was in the hospice he told everyone that he loved them you know there was a what you're talking about you mm. know which you're trying to introduce in your relationships. He had that. It was happening. It was like, he never, he never told people that he loved them. Mm. And yeah. for him, it was the opening of the heart. You know, this doesn't mean that we suddenly start telling everyone that we love them. No. <laughs> no. It might do. No. It just, no. That's an illustration that he, Yes. that is one of the effects of it. There's an, what it is it's the ego 
it's the ego which we protect which we nourish which we hold on to you know the ego often maybe doesn't want to tell people that we love them it doesn't want to open up and see the world beyond the ego meditation on death it's like knocking on that yeah cracking that shell Mm. like i don't you know at christmas time we always used to have these nuts you know in our family you know say again tough nuts yeah you know with the yes 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 the nut openers and you'd have the hazelnut the brazil Mm. Mm. what was it the almond yeah and some of those almonds they were they were tough nuts to crack yeah and even trying to yeah yeah you'd have to and then just give up on it and go for a hazelnut. <laughs> yeah, and then take it outside in a mallet. And <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough nut to crack, but the you know death is the is the, the nutcracker. That's the most powerful nut. It's like getting a super sized nutcracker, and it's, right here we go. Crack it open. Yeah. No. Yeah. But going back to the dosages. It's like you have to know where you're at and we need to, to some degree have some mental stability before approaching some meditation. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing that the one thing that I'm thinking of is that someone who, uh, you know, is a beginner would not want to start with that because it's sort of, you know, if you've got mental health issues, then you don't really want to be considering death because it's opening doors that, you know, might lead to, to you know, suicide ideation and things like this. So I think that's really important also, isn't it? Is that notion that you going back to what you were saying is that mindfulness as also in places when people have used them used some of the practices generated you know issues for for people so you know if your mind is completely you know, sort of like that you've, you've probably seen them the programs or the, the the articles on the dark side of mindfulness um, oh, yeah. and i think it's because it's being used you know n- I don't like the word right way, but it's a, it's about you know if you if you want to run a marathon and you've ne- if you've been a couch potato, then you can <laughs> just go straight for for a fifteen mile run, right? Oh uh, yeah, yeah yeah. It's um. That is uh, the, you know, the analogy of <laughs> my to uh, you know, from couch potato to a marathon. No run. no no, it's, it's a good one. No it's. It, it's a good analogy. It's, mm. um, I think it it's being able to respect the the depth mm. and the vastness mm. and to appreciate that. And realize the different strength remedies as a teacher to be fearless also, because sometimes mm. a strong remedy, a uh, strong medicine can be of great benefit to somebody yeah. yeah and that fearlessness will come if one has taken it for oneself and also the empathy i suppose that's needed to know if that person is ready to hear mm. this information and in what and it's often the delivery how you talk about it yeah. I, I yeah it's the, the because you know the reduction of the ego and the letting go of it leads to freedom um, but you can get lost in the semantics of it and if you've been trained and brought up on in a, the modern psychology and self-help books uh, many of those texts and books potentially will give you if you're hearing information like letting go of the ego and meditations on death as a, as a remedy for uh, potential mental health issues uh, you may buckle and uh, feel that it's inappropriate mm-hmm. so there's a lot of gray area and the potentially a lot of confusion mm-hmm. within this whole field 
and the reason why is because the mind don't forget it's formless you know you can't you can't suddenly say so this is what the mind looks like now fabienne is going to do a share screen and show you what the human mind looks like <laughs> yeah it so yeah it's um yes and i think it fits to what you were saying earlier on about you know like sometimes the breath does not work for some people i think that is the other thing you know the that notion that mindfulness has it's been sort of researched and sort of become really at the forefront. So it became like the new CBT, like the go-to yeah. practice. The thing is, we all unique individuals. Yeah. So as an individual, I much prefer the breathing meditation than the listening meditation because actually yeah. my mind wanders much more when I'm doing listening than breathing. Yeah. So the the part of me that finds it easier or that is lazy, like you were saying, prefers the breathing meditation. But actually, I challenge myself by doing a lot more listening meditation because that's what I need. I know that that's what my mind needs because it doesn't like it, you know? Okay. Um, but it's, um, and I think that's the thing. It's like, for, for me, mindfulness is not, a, you know, it's the one size, it's not a one size fits all. It's not a, you know, take this pill and you'll be cured and this pill and you'll be cured. It, it's a, like you were saying, find out what works for you as an individual to help you develop that, you know, self-awareness yeah. and, you know, exactly. attention, the intention. Exactly. I, I suppose the challenge is, is when you're, your mind is so crowded with conceptual thoughts and you don't feel that you, you can in a sense find out because you haven't, mm. you know, where you are personally with it, you have the expansion, the objectivity and the experience to be able to see things in perspective. I suppose if one is full of uh, worries and fears, which is happening now. And then after COVID-19, there'll be the, in a sense, the post-traumatic stress of, having gone through this because we are adapting, but at the same time we're experiencing the stress underneath, but we're just living from day to day. So when this is all died down, there will be that. And then there's the, all those thoughts, all those fears, all those worries, and then going along to a class or an app or talking to a counselor. Or, it's, it's very easy to, to uh, not be able to process what's being said in the most practical way for you or to misinterpret it or to be slightly waylaid, you know? So that's why it's really important that there's people who have some experience to try and help people be able to translate because it's a language mm -hmm. to translate mm -hmm. it into their own lives. And you know, the internet, it's a wash, isn't it? And it's like, when I'm wanting to learn about something new, you know, you go on the internet and you just think, well, where to start? <laughs> yes, yes. It, you know, and this could be something just like, what was I doing the other day? How to bake an oat cake. I mean, <laughs> I'm a big fan of oat cakes. You know, it's my morning breakfast. And I thought, well, you know, during lockdown, I'll learn how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Why not? And, you know, my, my mother's side of the family is Scottish. And um, my great granny has a cookbook, a family cookbook, somewhere in my sister's attic. There's this, yeah, incredible cookbook with an oat cake recipe in. Yeah, and... Um, so turn to the, the great gran granny recipe and then give that a go. And then, but there was a delay with the transmission of the recipe due to my <laughs> sister. Yeah. Being caught up in the life of a professional working mother, as you well know. And um, so then you go onto the internet and then suddenly there's like 10,000 different ways of doing it. Mm. <laughs> And this is just an oat cake. 
and then where to source, where to source the ingredients from and it's a so you know for someone who's wanting to learn meditation which is uh, much more subtle than baking an oat cake although i have discovered the subtleties of oat cake baking there's, there's depth in any topic right <laughs> adam <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, so I, I, I do empathize and sympathize and appreciate where that person will be at who's mm -hmm. just typing for the first time in meditation, you know, or mindfulness, or how can I reduce stress? Next thing you know, on a website and, and then, where to start, who to follow, who to, what instructions to take on board. This is why, you know, they, they talk about the oral transmission. You know, this is in Tibetan, the, the most powerful is the oral transmission. And they, they often talk about a, even a whispered lineage, you know, whispered in from one ear to the other. And you can see how the oral transmission from, you know, mother to parent, uh, to child or neighbor to neighbor or from one school friend to the next and this is really where the power is how we can help people you know mm. and and that's where the you know to compassionately be able to know uh, and to connect with that person where they're at and pass on to them what we can or if we can't to show the example mm. maybe in the future they'll remember the way we did things. I often remember with my mum, you know, she, some of the things she said, they just, it's like she, there's like a pebble, you know, and the ripple. And it's like a ripple just comes. I don't know if you have it yourself, but a ripple just comes at some point. It's like, oh, that's what she meant. That's what she meant, yes, yeah. But it, it didn't necessarily go straight in when she said it. No. Mm. Fabulous. So on that note, I think we can maybe we'll we'll tell people where they can find you because I think you're an amazing teacher. Um and you know obviously we'll we'll put on the description in the podcast I'll put your the links to your website and to to your okay. Facebook and um, if you send me all of the details, like, you know, if you're on Twitter and things, then I'll put all of those and people can, can okay. reach out and find you that way. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And then maybe, maybe we can do another podcast at another point on, on more suffering and, and <laughs> I know, more on the suffering part for if people are interested, because I think that's such a, yeah, a the, deep transform the transformation topic, of yeah. suffering is would be a wonderful subject to talk about and yeah. fantastic to share. Yeah, no, wonderful. Let's do that if you're, if that's okay with you. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, um, Adam, for you. your time. I really, I've, I've enjoyed, as always, I've enjoyed talking to you and I could really, really talk forever. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, we've had a fair few, uh, one-to-one -one conversations and yes. this is the first one that's gone public that's that's gonna be recorded so yeah exciting <laughs> yeah so hopefully it'll be well received and yes and, and, and all the best with your flourishing student thank you work. and yes thank you so much and thank you for everything you've taught me well thank you for the invitation and uh, making the time to create this mm -hmm. great work Thank you, Adam.